uh, I'd like to, to make some projections uh, about an area that uh, we've thought about for a few years, but now uh, uh, trying to promote uh, to get some measurements and, and other techniques about using the waveguide modes of a bundle of copper. Uh, twisted pairs as opposed to, of course, we all know that fiber is a waveguide, but uh, there's nothing to prevent copper from being con considered a waveguide uh, as well. So um, this is actually a portion of that diagram that Akbar had up a few minutes ago. Um, but what I, I attempt to do here is just graph the horizontal axis. You can see is distance, it gets shorter, and then speed on a logarithmic scale um, on the vertical axis. And there is this dashed line there that shows the speeds of DSLs uh, increasing over the last 25, 30 years or so. Uh, and you can see that they get up to the range of, say, as fast as 10 gigabits per second. Uh, but the distance on the copper is shorter uh, each time that this is attempted. So maybe not too big of a surprise uh, using the methods. Now, this is a match to fiber penetrating uh, into the network. Unfortunately, I changed the talk, but you can see that the copper color and the fiber color got reversed here. But the, the copper color is supposed to be the fiber, and the green is supposed to be the copper there. Uh, but uh, the idea is it's getting shorter, uh, but fiber doesn't necessarily go all the way to the, um, to the premises. In fact, there's about 750 million fixed access connections around the world today, and over 500 million of them will have some level of the DSL connection at the end of the fiber. Uh, about another 150, 200 million are, are also copper, but they're cable connections, again, with some fiber. And then the last 100 million or so are, are pure fiber all the way. It kind of gives you an idea after 35, 40 years of trying to deploy fiber, um, it, it, it hasn't made it as fast as anyone has projected uh, to everyone's home. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about is a potential path to take that black curve and make a pretty big jump uh, to the green curve here, improving the speeds by using higher order modes. The twisted pair, and if you're able to bond, say, four twisted pairs together uh, collectively for a single data rate, as is, for instance, done with Ethernet um, RJ45 connectors we're all familiar with. There are four twisted pairs uh, in, the, um, in the cable that's used to connect. Uh, of course, you get about four times the data rate uh, for that. So it gives us a, an idea. Uh, what we're attempting to do, and it's about 100 to 1,000 times uh, faster uh, at the same length. And important here is, is this length concept of kind of pushing back a little bit. So why is that important? Well, let me oversimplify the business case that you'll see service providers, internet service providers around the world work on. The average cost across, let's say, an entire network or an entire country is about $3,000 a home. It is not less than that, no matter what anyone tells you. If you want to put fiber all the way to the home, that's the average cost. The recent numbers coming in from some of the countries that have tried to do this with massive government funding, it's larger uh, than that number. And even at $3,000 a home, that's about three or four times off what a proper business case would make for a return on the investment. So if you're getting a customer paying $40, $50 a month for the service, you can't recover that kind of investment. So that's one of the reasons it's been slow is it just, it, it doesn't make money. There's nothing wrong with the fiber or the technology. Um, and it's really more the, um, the infrastructure investment cost for digging up streets and so forth uh, to, uh, to deploy it. Um, now fiber part of the way does make sense. And you can get down to about uh, 10 times less, about $300 uh, per home. And that does make sense at that level. It does make sense for the service provider to invest. Um, and just as a side point, I'm going to continue on here. We, we see a lot about the holdup on 5G wireless being that the need for fiber to a much larger number, maybe 10 to 100 times more small cells than uh, we have today, um, could it be possible to use the existing infrastructure, namely copper-based, to address some of that uh, more cost-effectively and thereby accelerate the deployment of 5G uh, systems? So let's talk about the 5G structure. Obviously, many and more cells, um, uh, higher frequencies being used up into the millimeter wave band, one gigabits to 10 gigabits per second speeds being discussed, uh, projected even in the new, uh, new radio standard from the 3GPP group. It goes up to these types of speeds, especially in the millimeter wave bands that are uh, now specified there. Um, and you, we get into this, this area of front and hall, front and back hall of 5G massive 
MIMO uh, systems where you have to get a connection out to that, that, that cell tower. Uh, you could do it with fiber, but is it, is it possible uh, to do that in some cases with copper as well? And just to give you an example on this, uh, from Germany, the Deutsche Telekom CTO, CEO, just about a year ago, uh, this famous quote, now some people argue with it, uh, and I even saw some, someone in the audience who told me that they were lying about this, but because they wanted to get a monopoly on infrastructure bill costs, but they estimated uh, 400 billion euros for just Europe to run fiber to all the small cell sites. Now even if that's off by a factor of 10, it's still too much, you could resolve the the Greek debt and the Italian debt and the Spanish debt for those kinds of numbers um, if you were willing to spend that. So um, what can we do with the existing infrastructure is an important part of the business case. Another thing that's perhaps not as much realized uh, today is the, uh, we see a lot about virtualization data centers and increasing uh, the software defined component of all of our telecommunications networks, whether that means putting a central office re-architected as a data center uh, or, or just any old uh, data center. One of the greatest needs, my understanding, for bandwidth inside the data center itself is all the software defined um, programs themselves being moved from one place to another. So they increase the bandwidth requirements. And so inside your data centers as well, there is still a substantial portion of copper. This changes every four years or so. There are companies like Cisco who have entire teams that spend their time trying to decide how much copper, how much fiber as they move a data center over. If they move it all over to fiber, that creates some problems. They want to leverage the existing uh, infrastructure. So being able to go faster in those situations can also have uh, some uh, flexibility advantages in terms of their budget and how they, they migrate uh, the data center to higher speeds. So with that as kind of the, the higher level rationale, um, what I'm going to propose here is to combine a couple of techniques that are somewhat well known, um, maybe not completely uh, known, but well, well enough known, together to try to use the waveguide uh, modes of a binder of twisted pair copper wires. And the first area uh, is the waveguide area itself particularly their effects that are sometimes called the plasmon polariton. Many of you here may know more about that than I do, but if you read about it, it's, a, it's one of the modes of propagation um, that's of interest, uh, that could be very much of interest inside a twisted pair binder. And then there's the so-called vectoring. This is the same as massive binder. In fact, there's a nice diagram, if you've seen the book from uh, Marcus Walden, the CTO of Nokia, uh, on uh, these two techniques. Vectoring is actually already deployed on DSLs around the world probably 50 to 100 million of them already, with hundreds of antennas. Uh, and the processing is very similar to what's used in MU-MIMO or massive MIMO uh, systems. In fact, you, you, the, the diagram makes the point, and I agree with it, that they're identical. So we know a lot about that, but the idea is putting those two things together, uh, and I'll describe a little bit more about that, uh, but the orders of magnitude speed increase that we'll project here uh, would be uh, applicable in all the three applications that I just mentioned. Uh, and so this is going to allow some rethinking uh, from in infrastructure standpoint of where the, the money, the resources could go to actually build faster networks sooner. So let me first talk about the waveguide uh, propagation modes. Um, let's oversimplify it uh, here, but let's pr pretend we had this big cable of wires and I cut it with a knife and I'm looking in from the side. And I've just shown three of the wires here. There, of course, there are many more uh, than that. And the copper section is shown there. This time, I got the color right in copper. And then there's some kind of plastic or, or um, insulator uh, around the, uh, the copper. And then there's also some air spaces that are in between uh, the, um, uh, the, the wires and the binder. And it's those air spaces and the blue part that are really more of interest from a waveguide uh, standpoint. And what we might be able to do um, is by injecting energy. Um, think of it as tiny transmitters, uh, submillimeter wave uh, here, so let's say 100 gigahertz and above in terms of carrier frequencies or bands that are used, and see the propagation of these uh, tiny wavelength uh, modes through the, uh, through the binder. So we try to take advantage of the green areas and the blue, if you will, and the waves are guided here. So the current is not in the copper. That would be a disaster. It would just get slowed down, and there's no, there's no passage of energy. Um, as they're down at the lower frequencies, say below a few hundred megahertz uh, in DSL use today. 
Uh, and so the copper is really used as, as a waveguide. Uh, and the wavelength is, is clearly going to have, if you look at the dimensions here shown on the board, uh, shown on the slide, less than a half a millimeter, uh, basically, for this to uh, have a hope of the, uh, the waves being able to fit into those, those spaces. Now, the twisting is going to, I like to call this a Swiss cheese. Some people don't like that term. But think of this, these, all these wires are twisting. The different pairs inside a binder actually twist at different rates. They do that intentionally in manufacturing the cables. That's what's there. So those green areas are going to intersect with one another. They're going to create a mess uh, inside the cable as the waves propagate down the cable. There are going to be reflections off the wires uh, back in different directions. Uh, there are many modes of possible propagation. In other words, many possible potential solutions to the Maxwell equations that define this. Uh, and it's a, it's a MIMO wireless a channel here. But we have already seen that one before. And there are quite messy systems today that are, are very accurately resolved uh, by um, vector signal processing, if you will, which has already been proven in use. So maybe the simplest example, and we're not actually suggesting using the surface wave itself, but this is just a simple example for a single wire, and it's something that's been measured uh, to date in these frequency bands. So-called surface wave dates to 1909, Sommerfeld. Some of you may be familiar with that work. It was initially um, uh, hailed and then, and then insulted and then hailed again. It went through its gyrations in history. Uh, but the idea was that uh, the wire kind of helps hold the wave close to it. So it's a little better than wireless uh, by itself. Uh, and they thought of this as actually the surface of the Earth being the wire. That's why it's called surface mode, um, the energy flying across the surface. Um, so these have been used in certain uh, so-called G-lines for television antennas you may have seen in the past. Also, the AT&T air gig effort tries to use a power line uh, using surface wave modes. But these are definitely wireless transmission, but the wire helps. So if you can have wireless. If you have wires, they don't hurt. Typically, they, they help. Now, there are some questions when you have the insulator. Uh, what does that do to the propagation around the wire? Um, and in particular, you'll see a lot of work, for, especially for surface wave, if the wire is bent, the energy tends to, to, to wander off in the direction it was going. And so you have an attenuation effect that occurs. You have two twisted wires or split pair. It tends to hold it a little bit better, but there's still some drift when they're bent. Um, now, uh, so. We're going to look at those, those modes and then apply some of the vectoring um, models that have been used successfully in the past uh, to all of this. There are also uh, TEM modes that are so-called plasma and polariton, uh, which basically have to do with the charges in the copper itself supporting the wave. Um, and some of these things have actually been me measured. I give a couple of sets of measurements. The first here is from Wiltsey. Um, he had a two millimeter diameter wire, it's a little bit fat for phone lines, uh, but measured the 100 gigahertz uh, and above band and came up with a certain amount of attenuation in dB per meter attenuation coefficient. Okay, so it's not 0.5 millimeter, which is more typical of twisted pairs, but he got about 0.8 dB per meter in the 100 to 300 uh, terahertz uh, band, 300 to 100 to 300 gigahertz a band. Uh, another set of measurements that we used a little more heavily was a set by Grishkowski, which comes up with about 0.5 dB per meter uh, for a 0.52 millimeter diameter. It's a single wire. Uh, second wire close to it presumably would improve that. But we basically, and this is a plot down here on the right hand side. Basically, up is, is less uh, on this, um, it, or worse, if you will. But you can see there are very significant air regions uh, above 100 uh, gigahertz there where transmission um, is feasible. Now, that would mean 100 meters should see about 50 to 80 dB of attenuation. Sounds like a lot of attenuation. But for, for, for if you're in the DSL space, I have been for decades, that's not a lot. OK, we know how to handle that. So that tries to, to at least give you some uh, optimism that something might be feasible here. Uh, bending uh, of a wire is going to be uh, less of a problem, we have multiple wires, mainly because there's going to be reflections between those wires. Now, not only say, geez, that's a mess. Everything's interfering with everything else. But with modern MIMO techniques, that's not necessarily bad. In fact, that's a good thing. As long as the energy is not going away from the cable itself, it's being reflected back. Typically, it can be recovered. 
and aligned if the transmitter and receiver signal processing are doing the right thing. So there, there could be uh, up to three or four modes per twisted pair that, that it could sustain data transmission uh, in the cable. Now, how are you going to get in and off? I'm not an expert on this, but uh, a simpler way uh, conceptually is to use a femtosecond laser, uh, have a photo detector at the other side, not necessarily touching the wire, uh, which I've tried to illustrate here. It turns out that there are efforts. Uh, one of my colleagues at Stanford, I mean, uh, Arbabian, has been studying the area of CMOS circuits for 100 to 300 gigahertz, and this actually comes from one of his papers. This is for backplane interconnect systems. But nonetheless, with 3D printing, uh, they're able to construct uh, systems with lenses and so forth that can actually create data signals in this frequency range. Now let's extend that a little bit and say there's a vector processor. And there are many of these lenses uh, exciting uh, different modes, if you will. Or if you think of it as just exciting the wires, I've kind of shown it in dotted lines here um, to remind you it's, it's more of a wireless effect. And then there's going to be an array of sensors, if you will, on the other side. And so what we have is this matrix H, which describes this channel. Uh, there will be multiple modes for each wire, TM, TEM, TIR, and so forth. It's a Swiss cheese waveguide, as I like to uh, call it. And um, if you've heard the term, if many of you in the wireless area have background, uh, rich scattering, this is ultra rich uh, scattering. And, and that's usually a good thing for, for MIMO systems. OK, let's talk a little bit about the signal processing. Um, if you have a channel, a, uh, sorry, a little bit of mathematics here. If you have a channel H like that, you can do what's called singular value decomposition of it. Uh, it's important for defining the transmitter and receiver. Uh, if you have a single user on the system, these turned out to be the optimum signal processing that would be used. Uh, it's a fairly well-known result. If you have single-sided systems where, like Massive MIMO, you have all the antennas in one place, you may have all the transmitters in one place in a binder of twisted pairs downstream, but the receivers may be in different places, and there's a dual of that in the upstream direction where all the receivers are in the same place, but the transmitters are in a different place. And so you can do what are called QR factorizations, that same matrix H. And these help define what the optimum transmit receiver uh, systems are. And uh, you can easily then compute what the data rates achievable would be. So uh, we took the uh, Rychkowski model uh, for the channel. And we fit that uh, to the data that they reported. And then we fit the same model basically to the cross-talking path, because why should that be any different? Uh, but as is common in wireless, and it's also used in DSL systems, there's a log normal model used for the crosstalk between the wires. And in a log normal model, you need a mean and variance. So we set that at 0 dB on the mean, a variance to be 6 dB. And then we uh, um, extrapolate it from that log normal model using well-known methods uh, to do this, 20 dBm of transmit power. We actually use 4,096 carriers um, between 100 gigahertz and 300 gigahertz. Carrier spacing is just a little under 50 megahertz. Um, some of the other parameters here have to do with the codes and signal processing that were used. Um, and we had a couple of modes uh, per twisted uh, pair. So um, it gives you an idea of the signal processing. Uh, and we did it for 50 pairs, which is not that unusual. Typical cables will have 50 uh, pairs in them. It depends on the country you're in and the exact type of cable, but that's not unusual. And then we use the, the signal processing methods that derive uh, for a, a matrix channel model to make projections. Uh, for these systems, we used a background noise, which we found to be reasonable. Thermal noise is minus 173, to give you a reference. So at room temperature, so here is 13 dB or so above that in terms of noise level we used. And what's, we've got a couple of curves here, but the horizontal axis is length, and then there's data rate. That's in terabit, so it's not a typo there on the vertical axis. And you can see at about 100 meters, one terabit per second on the so-called NLP. That means nonlinear precoder. Um, and then we also do a linear precoder. Now, all the DSL systems, all the 5G, all the Wi-Fi today use linear precoders. It is not optimum for a MIMO system. And now, it turns out it's pretty close to optimum for a lot of the channels they're looking at, so nobody bothers with the nonlinear part. Here, we finally got a channel where there's a difference. So we, we saw that coming up. And you can see the difference in those curves suggests that um, the crosstalking is so bad, uh, and it's such a mess, that you really do have to go to the nonlinear model. 
It's not that much more complicated, uh, but it is a little more complex than a linear model. And would, would simply ask tongue in cheek here, can any pound today get to a terabit per second, really in any length, uh, uh, for a transition? Now the pushback from the service providers, and I've talked to many of them about this, is could you slow it down um, and go longer at lower speeds? This is actually harder to do with these waveguide modes, in my opinion, but to push the length up um, and uh, lower the speed. And so here we did 100 gigabits and projected about 300 meters for that. Uh, and that wasn't slow enough, so then we went down to 10. It's now the lengths are getting longer, projected about 500 uh, meters for that. I didn't bother to show the linear um, uh, technique uh, any, any further uh, on that. And those are distances that can make a big difference on saving the money. I talked about fiber getting within, getting to about 500 meters is cost effective. Getting beyond that gets very difficult in terms of the business case. Now what we did was we actually increased the bandwidth, went up to 500 gigahertz. We noticed in Grishkowski's results, he wasn't completely sure of them, but we, we, we took it on faith, but what he did show on that and added the extra modes in. And in fact, the speeds go up, more modes to be exploited, more MIMO processing, of course. Uh, two, gigabit, two terabits per second was possible at 100 meters. This is some of uplink and downlink, if you will. So. Uh, figure one terabit symmetric. So that's where the, the name of the title or the name of the talk came from, was terabit uh, DSL. Now I got pushed actually by AT&T here in the United States that hey, look, you have to go longer. Despite what they say about fiber, most of their fiber connections today do have a DSL. Even the gigabit, gigabit power systems have DSL at the end of them. Um, and they have a massive amount of their network that goes out to 2,000 feet that they don't think they're ever going to be able to put on fiber. So they ask the question, you know, what kind of data rate can you get at 2,000 feet? So we, we ran it. I'm most skeptical about this because the waveguides have a cutoff effect at a, at a frequency below which you cannot transmit. Uh, and uh, we pushed that down to 50 gigahertz, which is about as thought, far as we thought might be possible. And you definitely need to use those lower frequencies. Uh, to get these longer lengths, but this was the projection that we did uh, for them. Uh, many of you may have heard of X haul or back, uh, for front haul on, on fiber today. Well, these kinds of methods could also be used uh, for that. Just simply carry the, basically the raw bit stream from a D to A or A to D back and forth uh, across an RF carrier to a central place where processing can be shared. So conceivably, these modes could be used for that. Uh, as well, uh, MIMO processing um, then uh, being largely at the s uh, data center uh, for that or the edge processing center. Signal processing, let's look at this from the standpoint of the analog uh, portions of it. In addition to having sensors, uh, however they're constructed, 3D CMOS, photo detectors, uh, lasers, or equivalents to that, uh, today, if you look at fiber optics, there is an 8-bit 65 gigahertz A to D converter that's used. Um, it's about 750 milliwatts per conversion device uh, for that today. Uh, and so um, you could actually see uh, uh, the processing uh, power consumed for several of these that might be needed to cover the bandwidth that we're, we're talking about in the few watts to 10 watt type uh, range. Uh, so that is not that far away uh, from, from being uh, feasible on a massive scale. Uh, pro vector processing capabilities. Uh, the vector engine we used um, uh, with a 50 megahertz wide tone spacing, if you will, was about 5 giga ops per tone, uh, which would be uh, 20 tera ops today with 4,000 tones. But before we get too concerned, uh, with that, the, uh, the processors that, that, that you can see today, the Tensor Silicon processor, the NVIDIA processors, are already well above these numbers. Okay, these are used in data centers uh, for, for processing. And if we were to take it down to 100 gigabits, lower the bandwidth, uh, would the cost and power come down by factor one-tenth? Probably. Uh, these, these signal processing tends to scale uh, with the data rate and bandwidth used. And these numbers, um, from going back to the early stages of ADSL and VDSL, you would get you know, analog people stand up in a room and say it's physically impossible to have an A to D converter. Believe it or not, one of, one of the, the wealthiest men in the world I went to one of the standards meetings today, I won't give his name, he's embarrassing, and said a 14-bit A to D converter at 2.2 megahertz, which was needed for ADSL, was against the laws of physics. 
those are dime store commodities today. So I'm sure he wishes he had not said that at the time. So we should not necessarily be daunted uh, by the fact that we're not quite there on the analog conversion devices, but we're not that far away. So what is needed to progress? Well, today, everything has been single excitation. What we'd really like to do is get a, a, a matrix characterization and to start with shorter cables, perhaps. Um, there's a stepper positioning of transmitter and receiver, excitation with some kind of periodic sequence, and then measuring from all the input points to all the possible output points. A lot, thousands of measurements for a, a single cable would be necessary. Store them on a disk and then process that and evaluate the data rates and then progress to longer high cables. And, uh, and then from that standpoint, we begin to investigate cost effective or mass producible couplers and signal processing for the whole area. So uh, I know there's some interest at NSF and there have been some proposals in and my company certainly sponsors and supports uh, one of those uh, that, that, that I know is in right now. And we'd love to see the area uh, take off uh, and uh, help us assess. So the conclusion is, you know, I say it appears possible because we really haven't proven this yet, but based on the best that we know or know how to do today, and nobody's been able to tell me of anything better we could do other than measure it uh, right now, uh, uh, this is um, kind of a pre-competitive area, and we need measurements, and then the consequent calculations and projections to advance. Um, earlier focus. If you listen to the service providers, they want lower speeds at longer lengths. This is the exact opposite of what's easy to do in the lab first, which is actually higher speeds at shorter lengths. Uh, that, uh, but nonetheless, that's where the, uh, the initial application could be. And uh, this may help uh, as well the 5G and the data center problems I mentioned earlier. So needs uh, funding and needs people. And if you're interested, uh, you know, feel free to talk to me. Uh, I'm happy to try to help you or route you to uh, to others who are interested as well. So thank you, and I'll just uh, let me put up, I've got a slide here crediting some of the, the people who've been helpful uh, uh, on these results here. So John, is any, uh, anybody still manufacturing this cable, or are you relying on the, the old-fashioned uh, thing from 50 years ago that are still in place? Well, well, both. Um, the, the, it, I, I think it's more the latter has is, is been the argument that I have made here that it's there, it's existing infrastructure, and so the cost makes sense. If you had to replace you know, a, a, a copper cable with something, you're probably going to choose fiber because the costs of digging up the street or whatever you have to do uh, are going to be uh, uh, about, the, uh, about the same for that. Um, if you were to look, however, are, are there groups manufacturing, is there a copper industry today? Yes, and it's quite large, and there still is a large uh, amount of copper cabling being constructed for a variety of different, you know, you, you can go to the store and buy a, an RJ45 connector, and somebody had to make the copper for that. And some of those groups have actually talked to me about what they, what they could actually do to make the cable better in the future, um, you know, by not necessarily maybe not twisting the pairs or doing other things um, inside the cable to make a better copper cable. Um, you know, I don't know if that makes sense to be pursuing here because of what we just said on the first point, but there, there, are, there are groups who actually manufacture the cables still today, and it's a pretty large industry still. Go ahead, Ted. From your past experience in DSL, uh, with cable interconnects, aging cable, you know, the real world problems, transformers, what do you see as the biggest challenge that will limit the overall distance with, uh, you know, corrosion of metals and the connectors and all that? Well, of course, e every service provider you talk to doesn't mean, and what about bridge taps and what about all these, these things? And, and I tried to, to say, well, those have all been uh, transcended uh, in, in the past. And what is needed first is just, you know, straight run of copper. Maybe all the wires are going from the same place to the same place initially uh, to be able to make projections. But the issues with bridge taps and spectrum management, uh, crosstalk between the different systems and so forth have all been addressed uh, previously. The nonlinear precoder that I saw being is going to bring in a new stage. I think this is going to come in you know, 5G wireless because of IoT anyway. You see it called NOMA. That's a new name for an old effect that many have seen before, but you share the dimensions. Uh, rather than orthogonalizing all the users of the system. Uh, and then there's an order 
of the customers or users or the applications that you have to solve that problem. There are some solutions to that, but how's that done? Uh, will be an interesting kind of communications uh, problem that, that needs to get solved uh, as well. Did that completely answer your question? I was really wondering, when you go up to 50 gigahertz and above, the actual physics of metal interconnect and corrosion and water leaking into a cable, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. All of those will be issues, and, and, uh, the, but they've been transcended in other frequency ranges no, before. Do it up there. Yeah, I mean, I, I talked to... Uh, I, I don't have him here, I mentioned earlier, but I talked to Amin, at, uh, he is up there uh, uh, at Stanford on this, and you know, some of these issues do come up in the backplane interconnect uh, areas, and problems maybe not as profoundly uh, as here, but if, if you could get 100 gigabits or terabits at these lengths, the, you know, the Broadcoms and Qualcomms and, and major semiconductor groups who would be manufacturing or working on these things, there's enough money there that they'll solve these problems. Um, I'm, I'm not so afraid of that as just getting the measurements to see what the actual cases would be. Go ahead, uh, Stefano. I would add that the propagation you're talking about are not differential modes in the copper where you would have the physics problems that it's around. Yeah, that's so, so that may be true too. It, it's alleviated. It's not the differential mode between copper and ground. But it's uh, in the surface. It's, a plasmon is light interacting with metal. So I, 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 I should mention one of the things that's come up, in fact, I saw Dan Middleman here earlier this morning. He raised this earlier when I first talked to him about his names up here, too, uh, is the, the uh, insulators and the effect that they may have uh, in this range. But Stefano raised his hand, and he, I haven't seen the paper yet, but he says he's looked at this area and up to 500 gigahertz, at least on theoretical models. It appears like we, unless you've changed your results since I, I last talked to you, it looks like something, you know, that, that, that we shouldn't let that prevent us from going ahead with the measurements. The major effect of adding the insulator is that you have a cutoff, you have multiple modes. If you don't have the insulator, you have a fundamental mode propagating with no modes. So, and then have a frequency, but in the order of some gigahertz, you have multiple modes, but then you process them. So, so I'm waiting for him to get this cleared so I can read about more about this, but it sounds very interesting. So. I have a related to, uh, oh, there's a question. Um. Thanks for a really nice talk. So uh, the key performance gain you're getting is with the nonlinear precoding, right? Do you think this is viable without that at all, or would you? Well, it was a lot less. I mean, the, 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 the numbers increase are so large that, that even if you're only at one tenth of the numbers, it still makes sense to to attempt to, to try to do this. Um, the whole area of nonlinear precoders is controversial, both in wireline and wireless. It's a little harder. Uh, it reminds me of the days, that, believe it or not, the same kind of issue came up in, in the what are called V.34 and the 56K modems, where they did eventually use nonlinear precoders. Um, there are issues in coordination of transmitter and receiver that require exact down to the bit level uh, precisional alignment between the two systems where they wander off in different directions and cause an issue. Some of those things are being looked at some of the ITU standards groups for these MIMO type uh, systems. Um, the gain has not been that great to merit the investigation and effort for that. I think we're beginning to cross the threshold in other applications as well where these nonlinear precoders and the equivalent, I like to call it a generalized decision feedback equalizer in the receiver for uplink, will need to get addressed. And they've been addressed in the past and I believe they can be addressed. But it adds another layer of coordination and standards between transmitter and receiver uh, that, that has to be maintained in order to do that, and then it becomes very controversial because of different groups will have different patents on different techniques, which happened in the old modem days as well. There was a huge fight that went on for decades uh, in that after uh, just on the precoders themselves and how they were used. So you might see some of that. So I think it's been more politics, and so there isn't that large of a gain. People have not gone to the nonlinear precoders uh, yet, but I think they will. Uh, as the, the whole area advances. Uh, the second question I had was about, um, so all of this is still uh, simulation based on theoretical channel models, right? 
Well, except for the single line measurements, oh. the, the, the so parameters for the theoretical models came from those measurements, but and otherwise so what correct. what kind of assumptions did you make on the rank of the channel and what kind of capacity? We used a logarithmic model. So basically it's a random rank oh, that occurs as you sample from that model and then you average over all of, they have more data, but I didn't show it on the 99th percentile and the 1% percent, you know, type thing and the 50%. We're looking mainly at the averages here with these results. The U.S., NASA is extremely, extremely protective of certain millimeter wave frequencies, for example, of 231 gigahertz resonance of ozone, uh, and basically tries to veto any such use. There were huge controversies in the U.S. in the 70s on cable TV leakages, the aeronautical bands, and in the year 2000 on broadband over power line leakage into HF bands. So one thing you might want to do as part of your early analysis is to understand not only what the leakage of a single wire might be, but if you were looking from on high down mm -hmm. in a city that was filled with these things to come up with some estimate of what the overall leakage uh, it would be visible. Because when you go up, the propagation loss is relatively small only about 200 dB, well, sideways propagation losses is huge. These, these issues have come up in all of the wireline areas about the, the emissions requirement. Now, presumably, one of the problems we were trying to address was the drifting of energy away from the wires, and that tends to spread, and, and the levels that I've seen are fairly small, so I, I would hope the, uh, the various no groups... So uh, yeah, we don't we don't want a, a space shuttle homing in on a phone line with with this. So then you know we would uh, we'd have a problem with it. But yeah. Yes. Of environmental resonances and NASA, shall we say, verges on the irrational uh, in the protection of these things. So no, I have had no contact from NASA, and it's a good point. And I'm happy to speak to anyone who might know more about that. Um, so it seems like you're. Um, Sort of a parallel with some of the fiber communications. You mentioned waveguide modes and things like that. Is there any issue with uh, the modulation type that you have to use? Like in the fiber, you know, they use wavelength division multiplexing and primarily focus on the simple amplitude type modulation schemes, or do you think We, we used coherent. We presumed coherent uh, here and on all the carriers, but there were standard types of uh, constellations for QAM, 16 QAM, and so forth. It turns out that the bit densities that we, I, d I didn't have a plot on it here, but I have looked at it, they're not, they're not as high, especially if you're talking about 100 gigabits per second or some of the push for the lower speeds. We're talking only a few bits per hertz or less uh, for these systems. So the 8-bit converters I was talking about would be well within range uh, for, for use and would support that. I think the signal processing is, is there. Uh, the main issues would be just getting that converted at these speeds and into a processor to take advantage of that. Okay, I think we've got to yeah, cut off time about the frequency. So some of the rest of the questions will have to be offline. Thank you very much. I'll be around today, so happy to take yeah. my questions.